So let's get started. So everyone saw the homework I posted on Canvas? And everyone managed to log on Canvas and see the things there? It works now? OK, so I just want to say from now on, I will be using Canvas to post class-related stuff. I'll just post homework there, assignment there. Um, do you get alert if I put assignment? So you should let keep that alert on so you will receive it, all right? Um, because I might forget to follow it up with an email saying, you, hey, homework is there. So you just know it's there. So it, there is a calendar. You can click. All the assignments should pop up there for you, all right? OK, so we take advantage of all that. Penn State paid a lot of money setting that up, so we use it. OK, okay so let's start. OK, so last time um, we talked about um, two examples. The first one, we solved it. And the second one, we set it up. And we'll pick up from there and learn how to solve the second one, also using the graphing method. Okay, So let me put up that problem one more time. So we call it the blending model. Those sitting in the back, can you see what I, can you see? Is that big enough? If you don't have good eyesight, move to the front. <laughs> OK, so I'll just set up the table um, very um, briefly. Probably I didn't have to do that. So OK, so a farmer is going to feed his stocks with two types of feeds. We call it one and two. And they contain three different types of nutrients. And each has a cost, right? So we have this table. 3, 2, 7, 2, 3, 6, 10, 4. The cost is in cents. And all these units, um, um, these are whatever unit per pound, whatever. Okay. And then there is a minimum value to be met for all the nutrients. So let me put this up. OK. So for each type of nutrients, the daily minimum value has to be met. Okay. And then we have a problem model we set up. We call this uh, x, and we call this y. So our problem is the following. Minimize the cost. Mm -hmm. f of x, y equals to 10x plus 4y subject to the following constraint. We have three constraints coming from each column. Let me write it up. 3x, 2y, bigger than 60. Um, sorry, 7x plus 2y, bigger than 84. 3x plus 6y, bigger than 72. OK, and also the non-negativity constraint. Can you see down there? OK, after the semester, you have very good sitting posture, always tall. <laughs> OK, so we're going to solve this using graphing method. OK, we, and we will learn. We solidify our skill of this graphing method, and probably something new we can learn from this example. OK, so we know um, these three constraints. We need to find the so-called feasible region. Let me label these constraints as constraint A, B, and C. OK, so let's f find feasible region for my constraints. So for A. Let's draw. So I have x and y. And you know I only consider the first quadrant, right? It's where they're positive. OK. So that it's the same thing. What you have to do, well, you find the line for the boundary of it where you have the equal sign, and the upside will be the region you want, right? 
and you find the two intercepts. Is that right? So the x intercept will be 60 over 3, whatever is in front of x, and the y intercept will be 60 over 2, where what the coefficient in front of y. Is that clear? So once you know that, it's quite smooth. So you have um, 20 here and uh, 30 over there, and then you draw a straight line and the region above. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's constraint A, and let's see, constraint B, how would that be? So this is X and this is Y. So the X intercept will be 84 over 7, which is 12, and the Y intercept 84 over 2, that gives me 42. Is that right? And I connect this, and I have a straight line, and the region above satisfies my constraint, right? Number B is OK. And then C. OK, it's repetitive now. OK, so the x um, intercept will be 72 over 3. What does, what does that end up with? What's 72 over 3? You guys play this card game called Make 24 with four cards? Not enough. <laughs> I play so much in my childhood that I'm very sensitive to any number that ends 24. Okay, it's 24, is that right? And the y intercept 72 over 6, which is half of that, is 12. Okay, so I connect these two and uh, I have this region. Then I need to put them all together. Is that right? So put together. I need to find the feasible region. So let's put these together. This is x and this is y. So I have three um, different values for x is 12, 20, um, 24, not um, really up to scale, but okay. So I have 12, um, 30, 42. Okay, so let's draw. For the constraint A, I have from 30 to 20, so that's, that's the boundary. It's the part above it. And then for constraint B, I have 42 to 12. I will draw that line. So it's the part above that, right? And then for constraint C, I have from 12 to 24. Okay, this is really not um, good. <laughs> the part above that line. So what will be my feasible region? How do I find out? The feasible region should satisfy all these three constraints, right? How would I figure out in this region? What will it be? It means it has to be above each of these lines, right? So you start from here, of course, I'm above all those lines, and then you go down. Each direction you go, as soon as you hit a line, you can cross. Is that clear? So what will the boundary of this region be? Well, this part, right? As soon as you hit a line, you can't cross, because then you will violate some constraint. So it's this region, so let's shade it just above here. Okay, so that is my feasible region. Okay. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Shall we be able to find feasible regions on our own? Okay. Okay. So we aim at solving this problem. So that's the feasible region. Remember the example we had last time. We made some observations. We found out that the, the minimum was attained at the corner, right? A vertex of that feasible region. Probably that is true here also. We are expecting it. So it makes sense to locate all those 
vertexes, all those corners, right? So let's say I did the work, I found out the coordinate of all these corners. Are we able to do that? This one is obvious, that's the intercept. So this point will be x is 0, y is 42. And this point is also obvious, x is 24, y is 0, right? To find the corner here, you need to solve the equation of this line and that line simultaneously. Is that right? To unknown to the equation. We know how to do it. Okay, so it involves some work. So okay, so let's say I did this work, I find all corners. Okay, so this part I did, so let me label. So what I have here is uh, 621, and this one is 18, and 3. Okay, so I have four corners. Okay, so where would the cost function reach its minimum? So let's look at the cost. cost function is a linear function, is 10x plus 4y, and then we know I need to find out the contour lines. Is that right? So these are the lines where um, the cost function equals to a constant 4y. Let's say k is a constant. So how do I figure that out? How would these lines look like? x. fix a k number, let's say k equals to 40, then you will have x-intercept will be 4, y-intercept will be 10. That will be one of the contour lines, right? So 4 here, 10 here. So what's important, uh, you know, it's the slope. So it's a straight line going through these two points. And you know all of them shall be parallel to each other, right? That situation is unchanged. So I will have a bunch of parallel lines. So I know the slope of all these should equal to negative 10 over 4. Is that right? And then you need to figure out, um, as I move from one control line to the other, will the k increase or decrease? Right? So let's say if I move like up like that. From this line, I move to the parallel line that's above it in that direction. Will the k increase or decrease? So if I move in this direction, x and y, bless you, will both increase. Is that right? And the sum shall grow. Is it clear? So in this direction, k increases. OK, so OK. So k is increasing in that direction. And keep in mind, for this problem, we are trying to minimize that value. So we will try to stick to the lower part, if possible, not moving up too much, right? As much as possible. So a way of solving this will be, so you know all these contour lines are parallel lines. You could take a ruler, um, copy this shape, and the slope here of this line, and then you come here with the slope from the lowest possible point, and you, you move it parallelly up until somewhere you touch the feasible region. There you find your minimum. Do we see that? We agree? Mm -hmm. Because once you touch the fe uh, feasible region, then that point will give you the minimum because if you move further into it, k will increase and it gets bigger. That's not the minimum. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's draw a couple of parallel lines. So if I do that, I start from here. That's a parallel line. And I move further up. And then I move further up. And I find out this will be the first one with the smallest k value that touches the feasible region at that point. Is that clear? So at this point, my cost shall be the minimal. And the point is still in the feasible region. Is that OK? 
Okay, so that is um, what we, let's write it out. So we find out that the minimum occurs at that point where um, x is 6, y is 21. And what is the minimum value? min equals to f at 6 and 21. And if you put in those two numbers and figure out, so 10 times 6 plus 4 times 21, and this gives you some number. Okay? So this is a cost, so we know the unit is cents. OK, so we solved this problem. Uh -huh. So how do we translate it back? What do we tell the farmer? What he has to do to minimize his cost. So what does it mean, this is 6? What does it mean, this 21? Yeah? So we would recommend the farmer to use 6 units of feed 1 and 21 units of feed 2. And then we'll tell him that minimizes your cost, and the minimum cost will be 144 cents. Is that right? OK, so let me write it, OK? So your best choice use 6. Did I say pound as unit? OK, whatever. Six pound of feed one and uh, 21 pound of feed two, and which gives minimum cost of 144 cents. Is that OK? Any questions of how this is being worked out? Can we handle similar problems? Mm -hmm. All right. OK, so if we look at this problem, look at the solutions we found, and recall last time the conclusions or the observations we made for the previous example, so what were the observations we had there? We had that the constraints are linear, so we have straight lines as boundary. So the feasible region is a polygonal boundary shaped, polygonal line shaped boundary region, all those holds, and the minimum is found at the corner as well. Is that right? So all the observations there, again, is true here. Okay, so let's put that as a remark. So all the observation from last examples, let's just say that, they all hold. So probably that's, those are general properties. Mm -hmm. In particular that the minimums occur at the corner, some corner. Is that right? So in particular, I want to point out this one. So we note that minimum occur at a corner. Okay. Now, we are not proving it, so let's say, assume this is correct from two observations. Later on, we'll prove this. It's almost true. So, assuming that is correct, do you get ideas? Some idea that um, give you an algorithm of finding the minimum. Mm -hmm. Can you think about it? So, this suggests an algorithm. If you know the minimum is always going to occur at a corner, assume that's right, what would you do to find the minimum? 
any idea, any suggestion? <laughs> yeah. So you only need to find the value of the cost function at those corners and find the minimum there, just at a few points. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's try that out. OK, so this suggests that we only need to check these, the corners. OK? So you still have to find the feasible region and find the corners of your feasible region, and then you can just evaluate the cost function at those corners. So let's um, set that up. Mm -hmm. We can do it in, the, in a nice little table. OK, so the corner points. We're going to list the points. We have um, four points, right? So 0, 42. 621 and 18, 3, 24, 0. Okay, and then I will compute the function f, the cost function at those four corners. So you just put in those x and y value and evaluate. It's easily verified. 168. Let me write 8 nicely. 1, 4, 4, 1, 9, 2, 2, 4, 0. So only those four numbers, the function value at those four corners, are meaningful for me. I just need to find which one has the smallest value. And that will be the minimum. Is that clear? So we found out that this guy is the minimum. So you say the minimum value is that occurred at that corner. Is that OK? Well, this algorithm one can use provided that that observation is a general property. Right, we haven't proved that yet. Well, it almost is true. So, OK, let's look at some situations that it actually is not exactly true. OK, so OK, let's talk about it first as a flexibility of the method of this algorithm. So assume now something is changed in the situation. For some reason, the market is changed, and the price for the two feeds, feed one and feed two, are slightly modified. Okay, For some reason, market change. And how would you adapt? You might have a different strategy. If feed one becomes much more expensive than feed two, you might not want to buy too much of feed one. Is that right? Okay. So let's say, if that is the case, so if now the price, the prices are changed to the following. OK, so feed 1, let's say I change it to 14 cents <coughs> per pound. And feed 2, I change it to 4 cents. Mm -hmm. How should the farmer adapt to this change? How, how would the problem be different? Okay. So do I need to change my constraints? There's no change in the constraints, is that right? The constraints are the same. What shall be changed in this table are these two numbers, which means my um, cost function will be different. Is that right? So I'll have a new cost function. Let's write it out. New cost function. OK, let's call it um, g. Depends on x and y. So it's slightly different. So I'll have 14 
for feed A, um, feed 1, and 4 cents for feed 2. So is it clear how I get this function? 14 is the price for feed 1, 4 is the price for feed 2, right? Okay. So let's use our um, um, new algorithm. Let's say I'm going to check those four corner points since I w did all the work and find out the feasible region. Okay. So let's set in this table and look at it. So, on this, so the table will be the function for g, g of x, y, and I want to evaluate it at the four um, corners. Okay, so there's no mystery. You just plug in the x, y value here and add up and evaluate. So if I do that, I have the following. I get 1, 6, 8, 1, 6, 8, oops, 2, 6, 4, and 3, 3, 6. Something a little bit strange happened here. Where do I find the minimum here? These two values, they are the same, and they are the smallest here. Is that right? Both are minimums. So both are minimums. OK, so can you try to think a bit and say, how is that possible? And uh, why is this happening? What does it mean that I find the minimal at two points? And what's causing it? Let's go back to the picture. So where are these two points? I found out that one is this point. It's a corner. And the second one is this point. They both give me the minimal value. So why is this happening? You want to suggest? The slope of the contour line is the same as the slope between those points. Yes. Do we see that? Thinking of the first method that we suggested, using the contour line, copy the slope of the contour line, and approach my feasible region with that slope. And then where will I touch the region first? It's parallel to this, so I touch not at a point, but at an edge. Do we see that? And then along this edge, because it's a contour line, the function takes the same value. So not only did we understand now why I have minimum value at two corners, we also find out that along this edge, actually every point you have the minimum value is attained on the line segment, on the boundary. Is that clear? OK, so that's the new phenomenon. So let's put this down. So why? So I found out the line through those two points, um, 0, 42, and 6, 21, that itself is a Control line. Is that right? OK. And then, then you can also conclude that the function g of x, y actually is constant along that line segment. So in this case, actually attains its minimum value for this problem. Is that right? along this segment. So we see that the minimum value is attained actually at infinitely many points. Not only two, but many, many, many of them. Right? So let's list our new observations. So it's kind of a expand our um, understanding of the problem a little bit now. Mm -hmm. So we observe that 
Now, minimum points, the points that minimize your problem, could be minimum. OK, so minimum could be many. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. So even though the point you attain the minimum can be many, many, not unique, but still the minimum value is unique. Is that obvious? <laughs> that should be obvious, right? If you find two values, they are different, and you say they are the minimum value, of course the smaller one shall be the real minimum value. Is that right? So that's kind of an obvious um, observation. So I would say minimum points are not unique, but the minimum value is always unique. You cannot have more than one. OK, so let's make a third observation. It's kind of a important. So let me ask you, if let's say I'm using this table method, I evaluate my gain and my cost function only at those corners, and I find out two of them are minimal. And then let's say I go back to the graph, let me ask you this question. Would it be possible that those two points I found out would be this one and that one? Could that be? that your function attain its minimal at this point and that point? Would that be possible? Would it be possible that the two points will be this one and that one? Would that be possible? So what's the difference between two points like this and two points like that, if they shall serve as minimal? So if two points, two vertexes, are the minimum points, they have to be adjacent to each other. Is that right? Along the boundary, right? OK, so that is another observation. So let's put it up. So if P1, P2 okay, are both minimum points, then what can we say? They must be a J, a J, oh, okay, I, I cannot spell. <laughs> How do you spell adjacent? A, B, adjacent, is that right? Adjacent. Um, boundary corners, vertexes. OK. OK, and then, OK, so this uh, number four is not really new. So we know the graphing method only works for um, problem with two variables. is only for, um, OK, let me introduce this. L, P, I'll be using it over and over. These are called a uh, shorthand for linear programming, because the whole course is about linear programming. So I'll just write L, P from now on. It's for linear programming, it's OK? Otherwise, it's long. OK, it's for linear programming problems with only two variables. Well, that's obvious because if it's more than two variables, I cannot visualize it and draw it on a blackboard, OK? Even though I could visualize it as surfaces in 3D, but that's much harder to, <laughs> to show you where they are, OK? OK, last one. So the two examples we have seen now are all minimizing. And you can easily think that for a problem that I need to maximize something, the same approach can be used. Is that right? It's, you don't have to limit. So works also for maximization. Say instead of a cost function, I have a profit function. Then I want to maximize it, right?
Okay, so these two examples we have had are nice examples where you could find the solution, the optimal solution, and uh, the solution are finite, and the cost is finite. But that doesn't have to be always the case because not all problems are so well-defined. Some are not so well-defined. So let's put that up. Okay, so we're going to look at it in a kind of abstract setting, not with word problems. So I want to make a statement. Okay. So there might not be a solution. Okay. It depends on the problem, okay, which you set up with. Okay. So let's put the statement up. So for um, linear programming problem, right now I'm talking about it um, with only two variables. Okay. We actually have the following. We have four cases, so I'm going to list. So the first case, that's the, the nice one, the first example we have. So this is the case that there is a unique, OK, um, optimal um, solution, meaning a unique point where the optimal value is attained like the first example. And then we know that the point where the optimal is attained should always be a vertex point on the boundary. Right? OK, that's clear. And then second, um, there are multiple optimal solutions. I could have two vertex as this example. So this, okay, so this usually give you one particular vertex point, okay, and this usually give you a, a segment, a line segment on the boundary. Of your feasible region. Okay? So that's that. And then Three. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be that you're not lucky that you set up a very bad problem that, um, okay, let me see, don't, um, let me write. The feasible region is empty. Okay? There are no points, x, y value, that will make all the constraints be satisfied. Okay? So in this case, we call the problem not feasible at all. And of course, there will be no solution. Okay. We haven't seen examples like that. I will give one. And then the fourth one is, OK, there is a feasible region, none empty, but the solution I found is unbounded. I do not have a finite value as my optimal um, value in the problem. Okay, let's take some examples. Okay, I'll get some examples. Are we okay? We need a break? Not falling asleep? <sighs> There was a semester I taught also a class that's um, 75 minutes, a 400 level course. I know it's a bit rough to sit there for 75 minutes and not falling asleep. The only person could stay awake easily is the one standing here talking, right? Yeah, I know. I've been to sitting in talks. It's very hard to <laughs> stay awake. So what I did was uh, um, we take like a couple of minutes break, just 
I don't know, if you have funny jokes you want to share with the class, or I tell a little funny joke, so then we have a laugh or we wake up. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, I saw Sean. You've been in my class. Is that the 411 you took? Uh, yeah, that we took, uh, we took, yeah, we took joke breaks. Do you remember any of the jokes you want to share with the class? They were like the same ones you told over the summer too. Like you would end your emails. Like, yeah, I have a collection of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Now, it's against the policy of this course. This course we're doing math that's really useful, right? So, but some math are very abstract. So there, there is saying says, um, a mathematician is a blind man sitting in a completely dark room, try to find a black cat that does not exist. Mm -hmm. So he's very quietly hunting for that black cat. OK. Well, very much the same can be said about a philosopher. Do we agree? Except every now and then, you will hear the philosopher yell, I caught it. OK. I'm the only one who's laughing? Come on, guys. <laughs> OK, let's take some examples. All right. OK, let's take an example for case number three, hmm? where the feasible region is empty. Let's say it's not a word problem. It's just an um, abstract problem. Let's say I want to minimize some function. Okay, And if you're not careful with your constraint, it could also happen in real life. The constraints are so bad that you just the problem is not solvable. So let's put some silly constraint. So x plus y, let's say, shall be bigger than 10. And then at the same time, x plus y, let's put it obvious. That's the 9. And x, y, bigger than zero. Is it possible to find some x, y value that all these constraints are satisfied? No, because this number shall be bigger than 10 and less than 9 at the same time. That's not possible, right? OK. So can I write clearly? I don't want to offend. Is it clear, right? So no solutions. Okay, it's not even feasible, let's say. Not feasible. Okay. okay, and let's take an example for the case number four here that we say solution is unbounded. Well, you can easily cook up many problems like that. So let's say I want to maximize some function. I can put anything here. Let's just put x plus y, it doesn't matter. Nothing fancy, subject to the following. So I have 2x plus y bigger than 0, and x plus 3y bigger than 10, xy bigger than 0. So I want to maximize the sum of x plus y with this constraint. Where will I find the maximum? x, y, they're positive. So you see, I should make them as big as possible. Is that right? The bigger, the better. But the constraint has no upper bound for the x and y value. So I can take them as big as I want. So the maximum value is unbounded. It can go to infinity. Do we see that? So we see that as x, y goes to plus infinity, my function f goes to plus infinity, so it's unbounded. Okay. 
So that can happen also. Right. Okay. So. Okay. So that's all I'm gonna say for the graphing method for LP problem with two variables. And in your homework, you will have four little problems for you to practice and have fun with. Okay. It's a. Uh, I don't expect it to be a big homework set, but practice that and make sure you, you know how to do it. So what we will do now, mm -hmm, and maybe um, next week, a big chunk of time, we will spend on, will be on um, learning how to do modeling. So we will go through a set of model problems from simple ones, and then, then we'll make it more complicated, and we'll have more complicated models, and we'll set up the linear programming problem, but not solving it. That comes later. Is that OK? OK, so if you have the textbook, what comes here is from two point, chapter 2.3. So this is one situation on production model. Okay. So here's the setting. You are a factory and you want to produce a list of products. Okay. So you might have two or three and each of them you can sell on the market with certain price. So that's your profit. Okay. You know. And assume you can sell all of them. And then to produce each of these items you need some resources. You need raw material, you need labor, you need use some machine or whatever. So they might be limited. Okay. So your goal now will be maximize your profit and within the range of limited resource. Okay, so let me put this up. So so first I am produce I'm producing a list of products, okay? And then each one has a price or profit, which I know how much money I can make from each. But then I have limited resources, okay? These could be like raw material, mm -hmm. labor, or whatever, capital, or whatever, many of them. And then your goal here will be maximize the profit. OK, so this will typically end up in a maximization problem, right? OK, so um, let's take an example. I, I just take the one from the book. Example 231. Let's go through that. Okay, so a company wants to produce two types of boats. So in the textbook, this is written in a long paragraph with lots of explanation of the situation. So let's pull out the key thing. So I'm pr producing two types of boats. I'm going to call, I will call them type A and type B. It's okay? Or you can say one is a sailing boat and the other is a luxurious yacht or whatever. <laughs> Call it A and B, all right? So produce two types of boat, boats. So I call them type A and type B, just to be a bit abstract. And then to produce that, I use, I need resources. So what are the resources I need to make this boat? So raw material, let's say, I need to use aluminum. That's my raw material. And then to, um, to work on the boat, there is some machine that I need to use. But I have limited number of uh, hours I can, I can use. So machine time, I cannot run this machine to an unlimited amount of time. Okay. 
and I have a group of workers that they work for me for certain hours. So I have labor. Okay, these are the resources. And these, somehow, they are limited. So that's the point. That gives me the constraint. So I don't have infinite amount of alumino or machine time or labor at my um, disposal. So I, I have to stop. Okay. So I can put all these in a table. So let's do that. So I put it in the table. Uh -huh. So boat type here. Mm -hmm. So I have type A and I have type B. And let's see aluminum. Okay, and let's say the unit is pounds and the machine time. Well, let's say minutes. It doesn't matter, it's just a unit. And labor. Okay, so how many hours I have. Okay, and then there's a profit. So in this profit, I already did the math, the final sale price minus whatever the, the, the material cost and so on and so forth. Okay, that's the pure profit here. So that's in dollar. So let me put up. So 50, 30, 6, 5, 3, 5, 50, 60. So that is already a step. So usually you have a problem. It's all described by word, and you should first set up this table okay, to get all the information organized so you see it very clearly. And then now comes the constraint because I have limited resource. So maximum resource that I could use for each of these items are listed. So I can use at most 200 pounds of aluminum, 300 minutes of the machine, and 200 hours for my labor. Is that clear? So that is the situation. OK, so here comes the question. So, so, so you are the manager of that branch. You have to make a decision. So how many of boats A, B should I produce? Okay, and within the limit of resource and maximize my profit. Okay, you have to make a decision. I'm going to produce 10 of boat A and 20 of boat B, or what, what will be a good number for me to do? Is it clear, the setting? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So how do we set up this model? So here's the modeling part. I, sti I still think this is a, a very, um, sorry, should go, come here. So here's the modeling part. This is a very standard situation. Everything's listed on this table. I think you could probably do it by yourself. Would we be able to do that? Anybody wants to help me out? Hmm? So what variables should I define? What is the decision I have to make here in the question? I have to decide on what? How many of both A and B, right? Those are the two numbers that I need to decide, right, to produce. So I would call these my variables. So A will be number of boat type A, and B will be number of boat B for me to produce. So those will be the things I decide and my variables, OK? OK, 
Okay, let me go up. Don't write too low. You sit in the back, you can't really see. Let me use the upper part of the board. Okay, so now we don't have a cost function. This problem is slightly different. What we have is a, a gain function that it's a profit, right? So I actually gain something. I want to maximize it. So you can call it a gain function or a profit function. Okay, so f, a function depending on a and b, what will be my profit in this case? So did we say that we multiply the first row by a, that variable we call, and the second one by b, and then we add them up vertically? Is that right? The same thing here, right? So I would have 50a plus 60 B. That will be my profit, right? So the difference here is I want to maximize this guy, not minimize. I want to maximize it. Okay? Okay, subject to constraints. I think that's all standard. So let's say I have three constraints aluminum, total amount is. 2,000 pounds, I cannot go above that, so what will I have? So if I add up the first column, it gives me 50A plus 30B. That will be the total aluminum I will use. And that has to be, how shall that relate to 2,000? Less than, is that right? I cannot go above less than two. Is that clear? So the new change here is now it's maximizing, and now my constraint is less than, okay? That's it. Okay, so the rest shall be pretty straightforward. Machine time, is it? Okay, so I add up vertically 6A plus 5B, and I cannot exceed 300 because I don't have access to more than that, all right? And the labor is similar. So 3A plus 5B. Now I have only 200 pounds, not more than that. So, is it clear? Any questions? It's OK? Am I done? Did I forget something? Mm -hmm. And what, what do I have to put up? Yes, I cannot produce negative amount of bones. Is that right? So I always have that. Okay, so always take that with you. Never lose it, okay? So is that okay? This example, so that's a, a straightforward situation, no complication, nothing complex, just everything can be represented at this table. You carry this procedure, multiply the first by the variable A, second by B, and you add vertically to find your constraint and your um, kind of a gain profit function. Is okay? okay? Okay, so that's that. Okay, but in real life, it, it's always a little bit more complicated than that. So, let's add some complication into the problem. Okay, so based on this problem, I'm going to put something more complicated into it. That's also in, in the textbook I take there. So now, let's say there's some complication here. It's not as simple as this. One of the resource, this 
aluminum here, I still can buy maximum 200 pounds, but the price will be different. If I buy only 1,500 pounds, I can have it at a lower price, and then the last 500 pound, the price will be a bit higher because I want too much of it. That's something that happens very commonly. Is that right? Okay. So let's put that in to see how that changes. Okay. So price of aluminum is not completely fixed. Okay? It changes. So let's put it, let's say the price for the first 1500 pound is a bit lower, so is uh, lower than the <coughs> last 500 pound, let's say, by um, a few cents, let's say, by 20 cents, just some number. Okay? So for the last 500 pounds, you have to pay 20 cents more. But there's still this cap, uh, 2,000 pounds. That's the maximum you can buy. Okay? And the profit here is calculated by using the lower price of the aluminum. Is that clear? Okay, so let me just write there. So the price in the table there, the profit there, let me see, the profit. The profit listed there is obtained by using the lower al aluminum price. Okay, so how can we set up? So it's the same setting. A uh, same question, how many of both type A and B should I produce so that it's within the mm, resource limitation and I want to maximize my profit? Okay, so you see it's a little bit different. Okay, so think about it. Any suggestions how we can do it? We just want to set up this model. Mm -hmm. So here, besides the decision how many boats I should produce, I have another decision. That is, how do I use the aluminum, right? Should I use more than 1,500 pounds, or should I not use that, right? And how much more over 1,500 pounds should I use? Is that right? So I have a third thing to decide. Then let's introduce another variable. So let now this variable x, I introduce a new one, okay? Be exactly this decision. So that will be the amount of aluminum above 1,500 pounds. So watch carefully the wording here. X is the amount of aluminum above 1,500 pounds. It will come into the picture only if I use more than 1,500 pounds. If I use less, x is zero. It's not negative. Is that clear? So I want to catch your attention here. So here, I am implying that x cannot be negative. I don't consider that. OK? OK, let's see how we can change our model. So what will be my profit function? in this case. OK, probably I should write, write this as pay attention. x will be 0 if use less than 
1500 pound of yeah. aluminum. Is that clear? Okay, so keep that. Okay, so now I'm going to write my profit function. Now the profit function depends on A, B, and also this x, because that's the part that incurs an extra cost for me. Is that right? So what will be the profit function? How should I uh, change it from the model I had there? So I will have 50A, the profit for making both A. Is that right? Is that 60? How for the other one? Is it 40? I can't see. 60. And 60B. That will be the profit if I sell those boats, which I assume I can. But then, if the x shall be num, uh, bigger than, strictly bigger than 0, I used more, this will take away some of my profit. Is that right? So I should take that away. Is that right? So for each pound of x, it costs 20 cents. So that I should remove from my profit. Does that make sense? So this is the new part. I'm going to circle it. That's the new part, the change in the cost, in the profit function. OK, so subject to all these constraints, so aluminum. OK, so how should I write out my aluminum constraint? So the total aluminum I will be using is 50, 30. So 50A plus 30B. That will be the aluminum I would need to produce that amount of boats. And then I know that this shall be less than, mm -hmm, the earlier is 2,000, but now I have to make a distinction of if it is above 1,500 or not. Is that right? So let me say this is less than 1,500 if x is 0, if I don't go above it. But if I go above it, then x is positive, then this shall equal to 1,500 plus x. Is that right? Does that make sense? So think again. If x is 0, I will have less than equal sign, right? If x is positive, so I'm using more than that, and I will have an equal sign. But that's included in the less than equal sign. So this will be the final constraint. Is that OK? So this is different. Let me circle. This is different from the previous model, the simple one. OK, and then I have machine hour and labor. And those two constraints are not touched. So they are the same. So let me copy. 6a plus 5b less than 300 and 3a plus 5b less than 200. So I will say these two are the same, unchanged, because it didn't do anything. What more should I add into this picture? Mm -hmm. Do we have a, we did not take into consideration that the total aluminum is 2,000 pounds. Is that right? So what does that say to my variable x? Louder. <laughs> Someone whispered here. Can I see, hear it again? X has to be? Yeah. Is that clear? Whatever. You can go above 1,500. That's fine. But the total has to be less than 500 pounds. That's above 1,500. Is that clear? So this is also a new part coming in this model. All right? And then, of course, always, always, don't forget the non-negativity. So A, B, and X, they are all non-negative variables.
Is that okay? Okay. So do we have the textbook? Have we bought it? Have we got a hold on it? Now, the textbook has so many, many um, examples, and um, I don't think I will go through all of them. Um, some of them I would just assign as like um, homework, and you go and read it. Would that be okay? They're kind of a similar, but you might benefit from reading more examples. I think so. It would be good, but okay. So reading homework, you just I will not check it, but I'll recommend you to do that. Okay. So homework, the reading part. Reading part. I, I am going to skip these examples from the textbook. So these examples are skip 2.2.2, 2.2.3. I will skip on that. And, uh, and also in the example in the next chapter, 2.3.3. Okay. I will not cover them, but it will be good to to read. Yeah. So any questions for this last example here? It's a little bit strange. Does it feel a little bit strange introducing this X like that? It's a common trick. So Think about it again. We'll, we'll be using this trick again in other models, so get comfortable with <laughs> doing it in that way. Is that okay? Any questions? <coughs> yeah. Can you explain about the point two x limit, like minus point two? Minus point two. Oh, that comes from here, because if you buy aluminum above. 1500 zero, zero pound, the price is 20 cents more. So your profit will be a little bit less if you use too much alumina. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So, any more questions? Okay, so the homework is due next Tuesday. Okay, just four little problems. All right? Okay, see you next time. <laughs>